Okay, so this is our first lesson um, out of, well, let's see, we're on unit five. Um, the title of this lesson is really pretty simple. Um, it's chemical reactions. Um, this is kind of the, the introductory information where we talk about some basic things that you have to know about chemical reactions, um, how to use them, um, some special ways to write them, things that maybe you've seen or not seen before, um, kind of depending on uh, which previous chemistry teacher you've had. Um, so we'll, we'll get to see some kind of nifty things this, this, uh, this time around. Um, so what you see on the screen here is it says that we're going to be working out of actually three, um, three different um, sections of the textbook, um, for four, for five, for six, for seven, which if I can count, that's actually four sections. Um, but it says precipitation reactions. And my hope is that you would recall what precipitation is, um, that it doesn't have anything to do with rainfall. Um, and you may recall that it is in fact, um, when you have a solid that forms from the mixture of two liquids. Um, sort of a magical thing if you think about it. Like if you take two liquids and mix them together, you expect to get more liquid. And in fact, what happens here is we miraculously um, create a solid and that's a precipitate. So we are going to be working with um, specifically reactions that form precipitates. But I also want to remind you, do you remember before um, from general chemistry discussions of things like double displacement and single displacement and maybe combustion, things like that? Well, do you maybe recall that precipitation reaction? That wasn't one of the reaction types you learned. Um, and herein is maybe a little bit of mystery. So this is what we need to kind of get to the bottom of first and foremost. Um, there are actually only three types of chemical reactions. Um, if you go back to your general chemistry notes, you may find that there were five types of chemical reactions that we talked about. Um, again, those would be synthesis, decomposition. We talked about single displacement, double displacement, and then also combustion. So five chemical reaction types. And yet now we're changing it up on you and saying, oh, by the way, there's only three. Um, well, what happens um, in general chemistry is that you learn these five types of reactions that basically help you to predict products. And those five reaction types are not wrong. Um, they just get categorized differently as you move forward. So each of the types of reactions that you've learned about before, we're going to fit into these various categories. So the first type is the precipitation reaction, and this is the type of reaction we'll be talking about in this presentation. There are uh, reactions called acid-base reactions, which hopefully you would understand what that would be. Um, and then finally, there's a reaction type called oxidation reduction, and sometimes the um, oxidation reduction gets kind of flipped and shortened to that redox that you see there. Um, so redox reactions or reduction oxidation reactions. Um, with each of those, you need to know what, what uh, specifies these reaction types as different. So for a precipitation reaction, as we kind of mentioned with that opening slide, um, two aqueous ionic solutions are mixed, meaning two liquids, and they produce a solid, a precipitate. Um, PPT is an abbreviation for PowerPoint, but it's also an abbreviation for precipitate. Um, it's an insoluble compound, and it's formed during a chemical reaction. Um, again, it's um, important that you understand the word insoluble, meaning that it does not dissolve in water. Um, solubility is something that we will be talking about within this presentation because um, the degree of solubility is what will determine whether or not we form a precipitate. So if something is very soluble in water, then it will dissolve very easily. And if something is insoluble, then it does not dissolve and then it can form a precipitate. So again, um, it is reaction type number one here on the screen that we'll be talking about today in more depth. So the second type of chemical reaction that we'll be talking about a little later are acid-base reactions. And these are very simply just reactions between an acid and a base. And they usually involve the transfer of a proton or a hydrogen ion. Um, so again, we'll talk about these later. And then oxidation reduction reactions um, will result in electrons being transferred. Um, when you talk about oxidation and reduction, you're generally talking about electricity, and that has to deal with electrons. So number two and number three will come later. Right now, precipitation reactions. So um, what will be helpful as we begin this study is if you have available to you your um, solubility chart. There was one that I gave you with uh, your summer assignment 
But there is also, if you have a textbook handy, if you could turn to um, page 150, there's a table there. Um, there are as many solubility charts as there are shirts in the world, um, and everyone's a little different. Um, some are more complete, some are less complete, so don't be freaked out or be really super confused if you happen to look at one solubility chart and get one set of answers, and then another one and you get another set. Um, it's, it's just kind of a tricky business, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth as to why it's actually tricky business. Um, so notice that this uh, second large bullet point, it says that uh, there are lots of lists. You must only memorize a few of the solubility rules on these charts. The ones you must know are here at the bottom in pink. Any chemical produced in a chemical reaction that contains a group one alkali metal cation. So group one alkali metal cations, we're talking about sodium, we're talking about potassium, cesium, any of those, anything that contains ammonium, NH4+, and anything that contains nitrate, NO3 negative. They will be soluble in water all the time, no exceptions, ever, ever, ever. That's the one rule you have to know. So actually, pretty simple. Make sure you know it. Okay, so as we continue on with our presentation today, um, what I want you to understand is that these reactions will deal a lot more um, we'll deal with a lot more of the solubility rules than just that baby one that you have to memorize. Um, however, it is good practice to make sure that you're trying these and, and you may start to memorize a few other rules without even really trying. So this is going to be our example together. Um, predicting precipitation reactions, you can see that I have a nickel 2 chloride and a sodium phosphate that um, I would have in aqueous solution and I want to predict the products. Um, this is stuff that you would have done in general chemistry, but we need to make sure that we know whether the products are going to be um, soluble or insoluble. So first thing, assume the reaction occurs, predict the products, and balance it. So hopefully you're able to kind of remember some things from general chem. Um, you have two compounds here, and so the subcategory that you guys learned last year um, is uh, double displacement, or capital D, capital D. Um, other words for double displacement include an exchange reaction. It's also called a meta thesis reaction, which is super exciting, um, but double displacement's fine. So if you know that it is, um, in fact, a double displacement reaction, you recognize, um, and if you had me in, in uh, general chem, um, I called this the uh, square dancing reaction because each of these two chemicals has partnered, and now you're going to make them switch partners. So you know, swing your partner round and round and do-si-do -si -do and all that stuff, and <gasps> voila, these two chemicals must switch partners and become this chemical, which would be nickel 3 phosphate, and this chemical, which would be the fabulous sodium chloride. So at this point, um, you have in fact predicted your products, and then we'll go ahead and balance it. So um, you can pause if you need to, just verify that uh, you're happy with my balancing here of 3, 2, 1, and 6. Okay, so once you have the products uh, predicted and the equation balanced, you now want to make sure that everything's going to be soluble. Um, so generally, you don't have to do too much with the reactants, but I'll take you through it at this point anyway. Um, usually it tells you that the reactants are going to be soluble or insoluble or whatever it is. Um, but nickel 2 chloride, if you would check your, um, your solubility chart, um, and again, this is where you may have some questions arising. How do I read the solubility chart? What does it all mean? Um, but if you look down and find um, the section about chlorides, it will say that most chlorides are soluble, and the nickel ion is not listed as a, an exception. And so, yes, nickel 2 chloride is indeed a soluble compound. Um, when you take a look at the second um, reactant that we started with, the sodium phosphate, um, remember this is one of the ones you have to have memorized, that all group 1A cations are soluble. It matters not what it is with, so it's soluble, yes. Okay, so this is the reaction that we've come up with so far, um, again, um, and now we're going to take a look at products. So we know that, the both, that both of the reactants are soluble, and now we want to take a look at products. So our first product is this nickel 3 phosphate compound, and if you take a look at your uh, solubility chart, Please first, before I reveal the answer, can you determine whether or not you think that the nickel-3-phosphate is soluble? Pause. 
Okay, so hopefully you were able to take a look and find it and see that um, it actually says that most phosphates are not soluble in water and that the nickel ion is not considered an exception for any reason. And so no, this is not soluble, meaning that it will form a solid or a precipitate. Um, how about the sodium chloride, which is listed next? Hopefully that one's a little bit of a no-brainer at this point. Um, we have a sodium ion. It's a group 1A cation. They are all soluble. So really, again, no-brainer. Um, so then once you have determined all four of your chemicals, whether they're going to be solids or aqueous, um, then you just have to label them appropriately. So you will hopefully recall the use of the AQ for aqueous in parentheses, um, the S for solid because, again, it is a precipitate. Um, in this case, I've put them kind of right underneath each of the chemicals, but you would put them behind it um, as a teeny little subscript. So, and I'll show you that actually when we get to the next slide. Um, so, speaking of the next slide, here it is. So this is actually how it would look um, as your final completed reaction with all of your phase labels, which again is the aqueous or the solids. And um, this usually is going to be a stopping point for, you know, writing a reaction. Um, however, I would ask a follow-up question, and this is something that you're going to see them ask you in your homework questions. Um, how would you isolate both products in their pure solid form? So basically, if you think about what's happening in this equation, you would take the nickel two chloride solution and the sodium phosphate solution, you mix them together, and when the reaction is done, you have solid um, nickel three phosphate sitting at the bottom of a beaker and then the sodium chloride is all dissolved within the watery portions of that uh, reaction. So the question again is, how do I isolate both of these? I want the solid separated and I want it completely pure, which means no water, and I want the sodium chloride separated, which means pure, no water. So how do I do that? Um, I would ask that you take a moment, pause the video, and think about it. Okay, so if you've had some time to think, um, my hope is that you would recognize that um, the first thing you're going to have to do is filter it. Um, filter the reaction mixture, which will allow you to collect that nickel 3 phosphate precipitate. Um, and then I say dry it to a constant weight. Okay, so what that means, um, you should have done a couple of labs like this in general chemistry, um, successive post-drying weights that agree within a few milligrams, meaning that you would dry it. You're sort of assuming, okay, all the water's gone. You take a mass, and then you put it back to dry again. And you come back, say, 24 hours later, and you check the weight again. And if the weight doesn't change, then it's considered to be perfectly dry. And then you have isolated that in its pure and solid form. Okay, so now if you think about what you've just done, you have filtered out the precipitate, and now you have essentially salt water. You have sodium chloride dissolved in water. And so in order to isolate the sodium chloride in its pure and solid form, I would need to evaporate the filtrate, meaning that the liquid needs to be boiled off. And then I'll be left with the sodium chloride, um, which I will then again dry to a constant weight. So be thinking about things like that. Um, you know, if we would do a reaction, for instance, that would produce a gas, you might be asked to describe how I might collect the gas, and then maybe I can filter off something or boil something off. Um, so again, something to be thinking about. It's kind of a next step when you think about um, chemical reactions and things like that. Okay, so... Before we go into some examples that you guys are going to try on your own, um, I have one little thing to mention um, about solubility, that is. It is very important to understand that solubility is a range. Um, solubility is, it's not black and white. It's not soluble or insoluble and nothing in between. In fact, it's incredible shades of gray. So you can have things that are a little bit soluble, things that are a little bit insoluble. Um, just like if you were driving down a country road and it began and you, you saw fog ahead, you can kind of tell that you're not in the fog and you can definitely tell when you're totally in the fog. But at what point did you actually enter it? Um, and that's that shade of gray portion. So solubility is a range. If you have an ionic, um, an ionic compound that you want to dissolve in water, if you have a very, very, very small concentration, it's probably going to dissolve even if the solubility chart says, no, 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 it's not soluble. Um, in any small concentration, you're likely to get an ionic compound to dissolve in water. So um, understand that 
Rain, uh, solubility does have to deal with concentration. If you have too high of a concentration of a chemical, it may not dissolve in water, but at lower concentrations it may. So solubility rules, they're meant to be guidelines. Um, the only way to really effectively know once and for all if it is soluble or not would be to actually do it. Observe what happens. Did you form a solid? Did you not form a solid? Um, that's really about all it is. So just to keep in mind, it is shades of gray. It's not completely black or white. Okay, so if you would, um, hopefully you still have your textbook open, um, page 151, sample exercise 4.8, this is actually an A, B, C type problem, um, and what it's asking you to do is to use the two reactants given, predict the products, um, and whether those products would be soluble or insoluble, meaning precipitate or aqueous. So um, what I'll have you do is go ahead and try this on your own, A, B, and C, and pause the video while you do so, and then I'll show you the answers afterwards. Okay, so hopefully you have some things written down. You've given this a try. Um, my hope is that as you take a second and look at your answers as compared to mine, that you will see um, that hopefully you've got some good answers. Um, but go ahead, just uh, I guess really pause the video as you need to. Um, I'll pause it here a second. Again, hopefully you don't have any questions. Hopefully this makes sense to you. And then here is uh, the answer to C. And I would ask that if you need to, to check your answer, go ahead and pause the video. Okay, so next. Um, now that we know how to, or remember how to write um, our basic um, equations, we're gonna move on to the next step. So what you see on the screen in white, that is what is called a molecular equation because you've written all of these different compounds and they are in their compound form, so it's called a molecular equation. Um, even though these would technically be formula units, it's still considered a molecular equation. And what the big yellow heading at the top says is that we wanna write something called a net ionic equation. Um, this is not something that I teach in general chemistry, um, and I, I always have a hard time remembering if um, Mr. Wolf teaches it or not. So um, this is definitely new for about half of you. Um, the other half, it may be also review. Okay, so a net ionic equation. Um, First off, what you have to understand is the way that we did it last year, writing these molecular equations, while they're not wrong, in AP Chem they cannot be used as your final answer. How much credit will this earn you if you write it this way? Mm, a big fat zero. Absolutely. So we've got to actually start writing things as net ionic equations because that's the only acceptable way in AP chemistry world. Yippee. So what we're going to do, um, you have to come to the point where you have a molecular equation and then you're going to do this second green bullet point. It says write the complete ionic equation, then remove spectator ions to get the final net ionic equation. Okay, well in order to write a complete ionic equation you need to know one thing and it's this separate aqueous ions. So notice that the nickel two chloride, the sodium phosphate, and that the sodium chloride in our equation, those are all aqueous. So we wanna separate those ions. So what I'm gonna show you is the whole thing, the complete ionic equation. This is what the reactants would look like, and you see the arrow at the end, and this is what the products would look like. Now I want you to do uh, me a favor. I want you to understand what this is and what's happening here. So you need to pause the video and you need to really look at the numbers, the coefficients that are in front of these chemicals and these ions and verify that you understand what the heck I just did. So pause now, please. Okay, so what I did was I basically distributed um, and multiplied. Um, for instance, if you take a look here, there's a three in front of the nickel two plus. Well, that should make sense. There's a three in front of the nickel two plus. But here there's a six in front of the chloride. Well, three times two is six. And so if I separate this completely out into ions, there are six chloride ions for every three nickel two ions. So um, a little distributing and multiplying there. Um, same thing here, six Na, two times three for six, and then two phosphates in total for two phosphates. Um, again, only aqueous ions get separated, so the nickel 3 phosphate will stay together as a solid, just like this. And then again, 6 distributes and 6 distributes. And again, you can see the use of then the ions. So positive 1, negative 1, or again here with the phosphate, negative 3. Um, 
So again, if you need to pause to make sure that you understand this, because this is part of, you know, how you get to net ionic equations. So pause if you need to write down a question if you need to. Okay, so the next part says, then remove spectator ions. Well, if you want to think about for a second, what does the word spectator mean to you? If you're a spectator someplace. Right, it means you do nothing. So when you look at this equation, does it appear that there might be ions in the equation that literally do nothing? Hopefully you saw that the chloride ions do nothing. It starts as six of the ions and ends as six of the ions, and that's it. And also the sodiums, they do nothing. But if you look at the nickel and the phosphate, you can see that they start off separated, and then they end together. And that's not a spectator. That's actually action, doing something. So you cross out the spectators. You also think of this as like canceling both sides. So six of these and six of these, it cancels out. And six of those and six of those, it cancels out. And this, in yellow at the top, would be your final, final answer. And this is, as it says there, your only acceptable answer. If I were going to ask you to write the equation of the nickel to chloride reacting with the sodium phosphate, this is what you would have to write. So you might even notice that the chlorine and the sodium, they don't even appear. But this is showing, obviously, much more... Um, much more sophistication in your knowledge of chemistry to recognize that the uh, the sodium and the chloride are doing nothing. So only acceptable answer. Um, and the directions that are on my test, both the AP test and my test, um, they will specify this. So just um, you know, make sure that you've got it clear in your head that this is the right answer. Um, and also just read the directions carefully. So now it's your turn. Um, page 153, you've got a sample exercise. Um, what I would ask for you to do is go ahead and read the sample exercise, try to write these net ionic equations, and then we'll check our answers in a second. Pause. Okay, answers look like this. So this would be your complete ionic equation because it includes every single ion. Um, and then you would have to cancel out your spectators. And then your final equation, um, final net ionic equation that is, would be here in pink. Um, for B, have to balance it first. Um, notice the appearance of the threes here. I'll take them away. Ooh, now here they are again. Okay, so you do have to make sure you balance this one. Um, and then this is your complete ionic equation. And then your um, potassiums will cancel, as well as your nitrates. And your final answer is here in pink. Um, again, if you have questions, if there's anything that you need to just take a closer look at, pause or record your questions and we'll talk about them tomorrow. Okay, so the final um, thing that we have to do in this presentation is a stoichiometry uh, problem in with these reactions. So we've done a lot of stoichiometry. You know, you're using molar ratios to convert from one chemical into another chemical. Um, but now it looks a little bit different. So do me a favor, get your textbook and turn with me to page 154. Um, on page 154 at sample exercise 4.10, they're asking a question that at first glance may seem a little tricky. So read it with me, please. It says, calculate the mass of solid NaCl that must be added to 1.50 liters of a 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution to precipitate all the silver ions and form, I'm sorry, in the form of AgCl or silver chloride. Um, it seems like a really tricky kind of thing. Um, there's a lot going on. They're mentioning ions. Um, but here's honestly the, the thing that you really need to focus on. What numbers do they give you? They give you 1.5 liters and they give you 0.1 molar. And what you've got to remember is that um, molar, the big capital M, it means moles per liter. And so if I have moles per liter and liter, it means I can use those two numbers together, cancel out the liters, and end up in moles. And again, once I'm in moles, I can use molar ratios, and then I'm able to actually convert from one chemical to another chemical. So let me show you. Um, first off, it would be important that you can recognize the reaction. Um, so again, you can be kind of looking at page 155. It has an answer over there for you. Um, but recognize that you're reacting silver nitrate and sodium chloride. And so if I react those two, um, and then go all the way down to a net ionic equation, 
it's going to look like what you see on the screen. The um, sodium doesn't do anything and the nitrate also likewise does nothing. Um, so you come up with your net ionic equation um, and then you start to do some of the mathematics that we talked about um, just a second ago. So notice that I'm using my 1.5 liters and my molarity of 0.1, um, always taking it out of molarity and putting it into moles over liters. Um, once I do that, then the liter cancels. I'm left with moles of AgNO3, which I then, in my molar ratio segment right here, notice that I'm actually doing a molar ratio with the AgNO3 to the Ag plus ion. Um, so what this allows me to do is determine the molar or the moles of just the ion in solution. Um, again, the liters cancel, the moles cancel. So what I'm determining here is that I need to. Um, 0.15 moles of the silver ion to react in order to do this whole process. Okay, and then they ask me um, about um, the mass um, at the beginning of the problem again. Calculate the mass of solid NaCl. So I need to now relate the moles of the silver ion to the NaCl using stoichiometry. So here, you're basically just doing the same thing that we were doing before, but you're recognizing that you're actually using ions in this case. So 0.15 moles of Ag plus ion. Um, there's a, from the equation, right, 1 to 1 molar ratio here. And then notice I'm doing another molar ratio here to relate the moles of the chloride ion to the moles of the whole sodium chloride that are available to us. And then they asked for a mass, which means I've got to convert to grams. So you can see a gram calculation here. And then everything cancels nicely for me. And I can get my final answer um, to the appropriate number of sig figs, um, which is actually three if you go back and look at the problem. Um, so this is a way of doing stoichiometry and using ions. Now, if you would have tried to do this with the um, with just the chemicals, just the the um, whole whole molecular chemical, it would have worked. But this is something that um, at times is the way you have to do it, and it just completely depends on the, the problem. So I want you to make sure that you've had some exposure to this because there will come a time in which you have to do a little bit more of this. Um, but recognize that you can use molar ratios with ions as well as full chemicals out of the chemical equation. So um, again, just record your questions. We'll talk about them when we come back. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen.